Consciousness is a very recent acquisition of nature, and it is still in an experimental state. It is frail, menaced by specific dangers, and easily injured. This statement was made by Carl Jung, and at first it seems like a bizarre thing to suggest that consciousness is a recent acquisition. But this all depends on what we mean by consciousness, as the term has been defined in various ways. The definition most people are familiar with is the sum total of mental processes occurring at any given time, and includes all of our perceptions, or simply the state of being awake. However, what Carl Jung means by consciousness is specifically our conscious awareness and our self-awareness, as well as our capacity to think. At first, it may seem difficult to understand the difference between these two, but consider the following illustrations. When you are first learning to drive, your conscious attention is dedicated to the task, but after a while of driving and plenty of practice, you no longer need your full conscious attention in order to drive. Driving is a largely subconscious activity, which depends on muscle memory, and so while your brain is engaged in a highly demanding task, conscious awareness is not usually involved. Instead, your consciousness is often occupied with other tasks, such as thinking about something that happened last week, or pondering some interesting issue, or wondering whether you remembered to lock the door when you left for work. Consciousness comes back into driving if something occurs which requires your immediate attention, such as an accident up ahead or a red light, but otherwise there is very little consciousness involved in this activity. Another example would be dreaming. Have you ever noticed that a dream can contain very absurd content which we don't seem to question? On the contrary, if you've ever had a lucid dream, then you know what it is like to be conscious while dreaming. We can say that in a dream, we are pretty much unconscious despite perceiving our dream world, and this is the difference between these two definitions of consciousness. Many thinkers believe that animals exist in a state similar to a dream state, where they respond to their world in a moment-to-moment -moment basis, and are bound to their instincts with no conscious awareness. This sentiment is captured by Carl Jung, who noted that consciousness seems to be a feature of the complex structure of human societies. If psychic life consisted only of overt happenings, which on a primitive level is still the case, we could content ourselves with a sturdy empiricism. The psychic life of civilized man, however, is full of problems. Our psychic processes are made up to a large extent of reflections, doubts, and experiments, all of which are almost completely foreign to the unconscious, instinctive mind of primitive man. It is the growth of consciousness which we must thank for the existence of problems. They are the dubious gift of civilization. It is just man's turning away from instinct, his opposing himself to instinct, which creates consciousness. It is possible that intelligent animals such as chimpanzees, dolphins, and elephants may also have some degree of consciousness. But there are reasons to think that only humans are truly consciously aware, and I will explain these reasons in a follow-up video. For now, it seems that before the emergence of consciousness, primitive man lived a signal-bound life, whereby his actions were driven primarily by hardwired instincts. However, as human societies became more sophisticated, they couldn't solely rely on their instincts in order to participate in a society, but required conscious awareness in order to navigate the structural complexities of societal life. Consciousness allows us to think about our actions and helps restrict our unconscious instinctual impulses. It is clear that our primate ancestors were not as consciously aware of themselves and of their surroundings as we are, but this begs the question, how and when did consciousness come to be a part of human mentality? This problem has been at the forefront of the philosophy of mind, and the American psychologist Julian Jaynes spent his life preoccupied with this problem. In particular, he was puzzled by the huge gap between the consciousness of man and that of other animals. The intellectual life of man, his culture and history and religion and science, is different from anything else we know of in the universe. That is a fact. It is as if all life evolved to a certain point, and then in ourselves, turned at a right angle and simply exploded in a different direction. Jaynes attempted to understand the mentality of ancient people by analyzing historical texts. While examining the ancient Greek story, the Iliad, he noticed something peculiar about the consciousness of the characters, namely that there is, in general, no consciousness in the Iliad. Instead, all actions appear to be precipitated and mediated by the command of gods, as it is the gods who order the characters of the Iliad into action. It is one god who makes Achilles promise not to go into battle, another who urges him to go, and another who then clothes him in a golden fire. The gods take the place of consciousness. The beginnings of actions are not in conscious plans, reasons, and motives. They are in the actions and speeches of gods. To another, a man seems to be the cause of his own behavior, but not to the man himself. 
All volition in the Iliad occurred by means of divine command, but was this merely a creative poetic device? Or is it indicative of a psychology far different from that of modern humans? Additional historical evidence led Jains to speculate that the latter was true. Who then were these gods that pushed men about like robots and sang epics through their lips? They were voices, whose speech and directions could be as distinctly heard by the Iliadic heroes as voices by certain epileptic and schizophrenic patients. Jaynes proposed that the mind of early humans was organized into a structure he termed the bicameral mind, whereby the two hemispheres of the brain were less integrated than they are today in modern humans. At one time, human nature was split into two. An executive part called a god, and a follower part called a man. Neither part was conscious. This is almost incomprehensible to us. The human brain is split into two hemispheres, where the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body, and the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. According to this theory, the right hemisphere of the brain corresponded to the authoritative god part of this duality, while the left hemisphere corresponded with the more submissive man. In normal people, the hemispheres are connected in a way which allows them to communicate and coordinate their actions, but in patients where the connection between the two hemispheres is severed, the two sides of the brain can act independently of each other. Experiments in split brain patients have revealed that the two hemispheres of the brain have distinct functions. For example, the right hemisphere is better able to recognize faces while the left cannot, and the left hemisphere can speak while the right cannot. The two hemispheres can even possess separate personalities, the left hemisphere often being characterized as more passive than the right. In bicameral times, hypothesized Jaynes, communication from the right side of the brain to the left occurred through language, which can be viewed as a code which enabled complex messages from the god mentality to be delivered to the man side of the brain. The right hemisphere of pre-modern humans may have had more developed language centers, which enabled the right hemisphere to send complex verbal commands. Volition, planning, and initiative is organized with no consciousness whatever, and then told to the individual in his familiar language. The individual obeyed these hallucinated voices because he could not see what to do by himself. The voices heard by contemporary schizophrenics and other psychotic patients, suggests Jaynes, are reflective of this bicameral mentality. One of the most common symptoms of schizophrenia is the presence of auditory hallucinations which sound just like actual voices, and schizophrenic patients often have difficulty with volition. Such voices often speak with so much authority that many patients feel obliged to trust and obey these hallucinations until they have become more accustomed to them. And this often leads to paranoia, as the voices can exert some control over the patient's sense of will. Furthermore, many schizophrenics initially believe that these voices are divine in nature. It is of course in the distress of schizophrenia that auditory hallucinations similar to bicameral voices are most common. As in bicameral times, they are recognized as gods, angels, devils, enemies, or a particular person or relative. Auditory hallucinations such as these can also be induced in healthy patients, via electrical stimulation to the right hemisphere, or during episodes of immense stress. Stress, which can be loosely defined as a conflict or disagreement between the two hemispheres, may have occasioned these hallucinations in bicameral man to mediate these situations. During the eras of the bicameral mind, suggests Jaynes, we may suppose that the stress threshold for hallucinations was much, much lower than in either normal people or schizophrenics today. The only stress necessary was that which occurs when a change in behavior is necessary, because of some novelty in a situation. Anything that can't be dealt with on the basis of habit, any conflict between work, fatigue, between attack and flight, any choice between whom to obey or what to do, anything that required any decision at all was sufficient to cause an auditory hallucination. In other words, these voices may have been an adaptation which aided humans in performing complex behavior, where instincts alone would not be sufficient. The bicameral mind would have enabled early man to approach situations which required a greater level of cognition, such as tool construction or agriculture, all before humans had developed conscious awareness. But where does the bicameral mind fit into history? One of the greatest mysteries in anthropology is how humans were able to move past the small group size of our primate relatives. Such archaeological evidence as has been obtained indicates the size of a group to be about 30. This number was limited by the problem of social control, and the degree of openness of the communication channels between individuals, and it is this problem of limitation of group size which the gods may have come into evolutionary history to solve. Normal primate groups usually consist of a single dominant individual whom the other members of the troop follow and obey. The bicameral mind is an extension of this group psychology, 
where the voice of the dominant individual in the hierarchy can be heard and exert influence over group members without the dominant individual needing to be present. Such hallucinations began in the individual's hearing a command from himself or from his chief. There is thus a very simple continuity between such a condition and the more complex auditory hallucinations which originated in the commands and speech of the king. In many early cultures, it was common practice to sever the heads of the deceased, leave food in their graves, or bury them and rebury them at a later time. All such behavior may have resulted from hallucinated voices persisting after the people associated with these voices had died. Although, according to Jaynes, we must not make the error here of supposing that these auditory hallucinations were like tape recordings of what the king had commanded. Perhaps they began as such. But after a time, there is no reason to suppose that such voices could think and solve problems, albeit of course unconsciously. The voices heard by contemporary schizophrenics think as much and often more than they do. This organization allows for stronger control over a group, and thus greater flexibility. The bicameral mind is a form of social control, and it is that form of social control which allowed mankind to move from small hunter-gatherer groups to large agricultural communities. Humans in these early civilizations were still quite primitive, but their instincts were reined in by hallucinated voices. These hallucinated voices may have also coincided with the unique human invention of names. As Jaynes noted, once a specific hallucination is recognized with a name, as a voice originating from a particular person, a significantly different thing is occurring. The hallucination is now a social interaction with a much greater role in individual behavior. The transcendence of tribal kings or chiefs into gods is unclear. One possibility is that this occurs when the kings die, but their hallucinated voices still persist, as many ancient cultures refer to the dead as godlike. At one site dated to 9000 BC belonging to the Natufian culture, an elaborate tomb was discovered with a heavily decorated dead king propped up to appear seated, as though he were still alive. And a similar pattern can be found amongst other ancient tombs. The king dead is a living god. The king's tomb is the god's house, the beginning of the elaborate god houses or temples. Many early temples began as tombs for deceased kings and were inhabited by statues and figurines representing various deities, and many ancient literary sources indicate that voices could be heard from these statues. Our modern religious buildings and practices of worship such as rituals and prayer seem to be the residue of a time when the gods were perceived to actually speak back to the worshippers through hallucinations. The church or temple or mosque is still called the house of God. In it we still speak to the god, still bring offerings to be placed on a table or altar before the gods or his emblem. The gods were in no sense figments of the imagination of anyone. They were man's volition, they occupied his nervous system, probably his right hemisphere, and from stores of admonitory and perceptive experience, transmuted this experience into articulated speech which then told the man what to do. Because these gods were so vital for social functioning, religion may have developed as a way to appease these hallucinatory gods. Certain individuals later in history, such as biblical prophets and Joan of Arc, may have been bicameral in a sense. It is also worth mentioning that many of these statues were not merely depictions of gods, but were literally gods themselves. In some cases, such as in Mesopotamia, having their own attendants to feed them. Religious architecture, which was often at the center of towns, i.e. the common town plan of a church surrounded by houses, may have also aided in these awe-inducing hallucinations. In agriculturally developed societies, two general forms of civilization emerged. The steward king theocracy, in which the chief or king is the first deputy of the gods, or, more usually, a particular city's god, the manager and caretaker of his lands, such as in ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Greece, and the god-king theocracy, in which the king himself is a god, such as in the Incan Empire and ancient Egypt. The organization of society depended on strict religious hierarchies, and all of this appeared to be mediated by auditory hallucinations passed from the gods to their earthly representatives, who distributed these orders to the populace. Such civilizations could go on to develop writing, which could be used to initiate very specific hallucinations. However, as populations grew larger and larger and Bronze Age civilizations became more sophisticated, such a system as the bicameral mind would not be able to maintain societal order as the intentions of hallucinated voices would inevitably come into conflict with each other. Population growth and clashes between different cultures, along with various climatic changes, may have led to periods of civil unrest and the collapse of authority. 
During these tumultuous times, which were faced by nearly all early civilizations, the admonitory knowledge delivered through hallucinated voices may have failed to help men adapt quickly. In other words, hallucinations which repeated the same information over and over again could not help in novel situations. It could be asked at this point why man did not simply revert to his previous condition. Sometimes he did, but the inertia of more complex cultures prevented the return to tribal life. Man was trapped in his own civilization. Huge cities are simply there, and their ponderous habits of working keep going even as their divine control lapses away. Language too is a break upon social change. Natural selection, along with the neuroplasticity of the human brain, would have favored people capable of self-directed conscious intentions who could make decisions with greater ease than bicameral men. It is well known that the brain is capable of adapting to new circumstances, and consciousness may be an adaptation to a certain kind of environment. Subjective consciousness, in which an I could narratize out alternate actions, was of course the great world result of this dilemma. When this breakdown occurs, which also seems to coincide with a greater degree of intelligence, the god part of the person's mentality no longer seems to be coming from an external god, but from himself. He is not ordered by the gods, but by himself. Such a person, newly imbued with an ego, is then capable of directing themselves in the world, and is no longer an unconscious automaton being guided by hallucinatory voices. Consciousness, Jane suggests, has its origins in the breakdown of the bicameral mind. The presence of voices which had to be obeyed were the absolute prerequisite to the conscious stage of mind, in which it is the self that is responsible and can debate within itself, can order and direct, and that the creation of such a self is the product of culture. In a sense, we have become our own gods. In future videos, we will look at problems relating to this theory, in particular what is the relationship between consciousness and language, what were bicameral civilizations like, and what is the evidence of the bicameral mind in the modern world.